Hi everybody, welcome to Social Psychology UNISA PYC 3701. I hope this, these video sessions help you as much as they help me. Uh, you can like, subscribe and share, or you can visit my website, see the link below, to do quizzes and synopses of the key points in each chapter. Okay, so we're doing chapter two, social cognition. Right. Um, we are not designed to solve logical, rational problems about what is real, what is true, and what is objective. We have evolved to survive and to reproduce successfully. And the way our brains function reflects that. Um, nowadays, manipulating the way our minds work is a trillion dollar industry and it's becoming ever more powerful, driven by social media and the fourth industrial revolution. So let's look at some of the ways that this plays out. Um, some of it is really not, in, as our intuition would have it, it's counterintuitive. Okay. Firstly, we use heuristics as ways to avoid excessive mental effort. Heuristics are simple rules for making complex decisions or drawing inferences, making up our minds quickly and without effort. Okay. We also use prototypes. When we think about something, we often use um, a standard image of it. For example, my standard image of a tree is a brown trunk and the green things on front and top like a child's drawing is my prototype tree. We also have schemas. Schemas are mental frameworks um, around a theme to tell us what to do, how to do, and what to expect. For example, we all have schemas of how to shop in a supermarket. And when we have fully automated supermarkets, our schemas will be dated, and it may take time, some time to change that schema. Schemas don't change quickly, they tend to persevere, the perseverance effect, even in the face of evidence that does not fit into them. Um, we are most likely to pay attention to, to notice, to encode, to remember, and to retrieve, to bring back from memory, information that fits into a schema, unless it's shockingly different, in which case we will notice it encode it and retrieve it more easily. We are also reluctant to cast aside or modify our schemas. Priming. Priming is almost like a mental trick. What we are exposed to primes our minds as to what to expect. And this can be manipulated. For example, xenophobia is manipulated and primed by politicians and people who have, um, who stand to gain from the phenomenon in South African society. Okay, when we have too much going on, too much information coming in, we get information overload and we so literally cannot take in new information. It's like our hard drives have frozen. We haven't got enough RAM. Okay, that's information overload. Let's look at some of the heuristics we use to prevent information overload. The representative or representativeness heuristic. Um, we make judgments based on how we can categorize uh, situations, people, or things. And then we respond to everything that fits into that category in the same way. Availability. There's two ways with the availability heuristic works. One is with feelings. Um, whatever um, is easiest to think of, when we're thinking about things using our feelings is our available ability heuristic. Um, so for example, if I think about um, plane accidents, 
being more dangerous than car accidents because I see it on the headlines. And the other is how much information do we have about the subject? And this is when we're thinking about things logically, but not necessarily correctly. We will make decisions based on what we know the most about rather than an objective reality. Okay, the other heuristic is anchoring and adjustment. Um, anchoring adjustment, you basically grab onto any information that's given to you, especially with numbers, okay? Um, but also with values and personal experiences. And then you adjust it a little bit as um, according to the situation. When we think intuitively, holistically, and in the moment, it's called automatic thought processes. Automatic thought processes take uh, relatively little energy and they can be very accurate at times and very useful. Um, for example, when assessing danger, an automatic process can serve you very, very well. The other kind of process is when we stop, think carefully, draw facts from memory, and then make decisions. This is strenuous and rigorous, and it's called controlled thought process. And we're using less heuristics because we're actually trying to assess what's going on in the situation for real. We have some built-in errors. The negativity bias, we will notice threats more quickly and easily than anything else. So we will notice negative stimuli more easily than positive stimuli for survival reasons. However, we also think things will turn out better. Um, we expect ourselves to succeed. This is the overconfidence barrier even if we have failed before. We expect the future to be better than the past. The planning fantasy is that we will always expect the whatever we're planning to take less time than it actually does. And there are several reasons for this. Um, firstly, when we're thinking about planning, we're thinking about the future and we forget all the things that went wrong in the past. Secondly, when we're thinking about planning, we're thinking about what we're going to do instead of thinking about what might happen. And of course, you can remember any project was delayed enormously by things that you couldn't control. Okay. And thirdly, when we really want to do something, we're highly motivated, we get even more optimistic about it. And fourthly, we do see the future in... Um, a golden light. We think about the positives, not the negatives. So all of these will throw our plans out of into a state of inaccuracy. Okay. Uh, when assessing uh, things that have happened in our lives, we utilize something called counterfactual thinking, imagining alternative outcomes. I get a B in the exam, I imagine getting an A, imagining a positive counterfactual situation uh, makes me feel bad, I didn't get my A. Uh, but it also makes me think, hey, if I would studied this, that, and the other thing better, I could have gotten an A. If I imagine failing when I got my B, I feel happy. My affect goes up because I'm comparing myself to what could have been worse. So people use counterfactual thinking not only to assess how they can affect outcomes again in the future, but also to manage their feelings skillfully. Um, people may use thought suppression as well to manage their feelings. Uh, this is about monitoring for unwanted thoughts and then using an operating process to suppress those thoughts the system of thought suppression can fail under stress and it can then rebound. If you're trying not to smoke, when you do give in to that desire, it's going to be stronger. We use magical thinking. For example, the law of similarity that objects that resemble one another have similar properties, which is why no one wants to eat a chocolate cockroach. 
and it's found in herbalist traditions around the world, which is why the sausage tree is known to help with virility issues. Okay. Uh, terror management. No one can hold the thought of their own mortality and human frailty in their minds for very long. We quickly forget that we are inches from death every time that we drive. Okay, thinking and feeling. Affect, feeling, cognition, thinking. Neuroscience has confirmed that these are two different operating systems in the brain. The feeling side of the brain or aspect of the brain, neurological processing, responds very quickly, it's impulsive, it's focused on the now and is driven by feeling. Um, the thinking part of the brain thinks long-term, delays gratification, assesses facts and information and puts it into logical order. And but these two parts of the brain do interact and affect one another deeply in certain ways. Okay, what you think determines how you feel. So if you have a positive schema, you will feel positive. If you have a negative, negative. How you feel determines what you think. It determines what you, what catches your attention, what you encode and what you retrieve. Um, so when you are happy, you see all the things in the world that are associated with happiness. Happy people, beautiful skies, etc. When you are in a negative state, you, your thoughts will turn negative and so do your perceptions. This is called mood congruence effects. Another important one to remember is mood dependent memory. If you are studying this when you are very happy, try to be happy again when you are writing the exam because you will remember what you learned when you were happy when you feel happy again. The same goes for unhappy states of mind. Okay, when we are happy, we are often an autopilot and heuristic. It's relatively effortless. So a positive state of mind can actually make you less rational and less objective. But of course, it is much better for survival in terms of lower stress. Okay, that's the end of chapter two. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share and go to the website to do old exam questions and see summaries of the key vocab, as well as some nice videos.